The night is growing colder. Kalen is shivering and mist is emanating from his nose and mouth with every exhale. As he stares at the three-quarter moon overhead, waiting. All is quiet. Kalen peers down. He stares longingly at the rolled-up sleeping bag and tent strapped to the bottom of his pack. He shouldn't have abandoned his gear. Kalen uses the rope and climbing equipment to secure his belay. He clumsily upsails three-quarters of the way down and hangs on the line, scoping the area, laboring to see in the dark to see if it's safe. Everything looks okay. He absails all the way down to the ground. Kalen straps the pack and the rifle to the line in order to hoist them up. He notices mist emanating from a nearby boulder, slowly realizing it isn't a boulder. The mist is emanating from a huge, foaming, diabolically incensed snout. Kalen scrambles back up the rock formation. The beast charges, runs up on its hind legs, leaps up at him, and claws at the soles of his boots as it smashes into the rock formation. Kalen arrests his fall by holding onto the line. He resumes climbing for dear life. The beast does it all again, smashing violently into the steep rock formation, unable to climb it. Kalen barely makes it up to the top, near hysterics. The beast again charges and crashes into the rock formation, managing to sink its claws into it this time, begins climbing. Kalen climbs down the opposite side. Three quarters of the way down, he falls off, but gets up and runs for his life. Kalen blows past the trees, goes over and around logs and boulders, then dives into a grove of shrubbery, crawls through, and resumes his sprint as the pursuing beast scrawls devolve into a dissonance of seething diabolic fury. Kalen cuts an abrupt turn around a massive boulder, but then suddenly scrambles to a frenzied stop, slipping, falling, sliding towards something horrific. The scar-faced grizzly bear. He curls up into a ball as the bear charges him, and the demonic fury swoops in on him from behind, and then is sprayed with blood as the grizzly and the demonic beast tear into one another. Kalen crawls away from the swivel of claws and teeth, glimpsing the demonic beast, which appears to be a werewolf, only three-quarter transformed, wearing a crimson cloak. Just then, the order emerges grimly from the darkness, appearing to have tracked the werewolf. They converge upon the warring monstrosity, swords in hand. As Sal and I have discussed, we've discussed What is to say that, that a werewolf is only a werewolf or can only become a werewolf during the full moon and that the transformation must be a complete, uniform, and symmetrical transformation? Nature and logic would tell us if, in fact, anyone who's afflicted with such a curse would probably show manifestations of that curse throughout the entire phase of the moon life. Through any phase of the moon, one would think that the afflicted would show no symptoms, would show no outward manifestation of the curse when there is no moon, such as during a new moon. During the new moon, there is no moon. If one is afflicted with werewolfism, you would think there would be zero transformation during a new moon when there is no moon. And then, when we have a quarter moon, one would think that the manifestation of the werewolfism would be proportional or would match the phase of the moon. A quarter moon would equal one quarter transformation. And then this piece of conceptual art here, we're depicting what Damiana would look like during a quarter moon. The transformation would be one quarter transformation. And as I discussed, who says the transformation has to be uniform and symmetrical and pretty? 
Werewolfism is an abomination. There's nothing natural about it. The curse stems not from our natural world. The curse is, is spiritual in nature. It is from a realm beyond our realm, beyond the natural, beyond nature. If anything, it's a freak of nature. It's an abomination. And like any freak of nature, it's it shows no no conformity to the laws of nature. There's nothing symmetrical about it. There's nothing uniform about it. It's an abomination. Likewise, during a quarter moon, Damiana's transformation, or, or any other werewolf in this story, the transformation of the werewolf would be proportional to the phase of the moon. So, when we look at this conceptual piece here of Damiana during the quarter moon, and we see a one-quarter transformation, we see one eye that's bigger than the other, we see a mouth and teeth and face that are contorted in a way, are not symmetrical. The transformation is not uniform. We see the profaneness of the curse. We see the evil at the curse's core. And we see what we are truly up against. Yes, this is a werewolf story. But what is the curse? Where did it come from? And what's truly at stake? Now, another, another great thing about the mythology is that since we're exploring werewolves, lycanthropes, during the entire phase of the moon cycle, and the Siren Moon story takes place over the course of one moon cycle, it enables the werewolves to become more interesting and a little more multifaceted. Because during, during a new moon, when there is no moon, as well as during the partial transformations, say during the quarter moon, during the half moon, during the three-quarter moon, as the transformation becomes more gradual and it gets worse and worse and worse, the werewolf's mental faculties are still operating and there's still some humanity in there. There's some reasoning, there's some thought. Yes, there's an instinct to kill. Yes, they are partial monsters, but there's still some humanity in them, which enables some interesting interactions with, with the werewolf without the limitations of the traditional mythology, which says a werewolf can only become a werewolf during the full moon and during the full moon it's a full transformation it's fully uniform and it's a complete transformation and the werewolf is all monster it's all animal it's all roaring it's all biting it's nothing but killing and there's no there's no added layers of dimension there it's just a big animal running around killing people and that's good we do have that in siren moon during the full moon the werewolves do become like that but what's not to say that leading up to the full moon we can't have much more interesting interactions with these werewolves and have interesting looks to these werewolves as we, as we see in this partial transformation here and to have more of a dynamic leading up to the full moon. Siren moon, the big climax of Siren moon is the full moon and that's at the end. So that's what went into reinventing the mythology and as we see in this conceptual piece here um, it adds new layers. It adds a new layer of, of, of dimension to the, to the classic werewolf mythology. And I think it's the next generation. Uh, and I think it could become a, a, a step forward in the evolution of the genre where we can make werewolves as interesting as vampires. And the reason why vampires are so interesting is that they're 
they appear to be half human at all times. And they, they have an ability to reason and an ability to talk. And they're very human. They appear to be very human in their emotions. So it allows vampire movies to achieve a level of drama that is previously unknown to the werewolf genre. Often because the werewolf itself is a monster, 100% animal. It can't reason, it can't talk. There is no humanity left in it anymore. Well, we, we bring that humanity to the werewolf mythology, that layer of dimension, and we bring the drama in to fully flesh out the mythology. And this is a big reason why we believe Siren Moon is the, is the next step in the evolution of the werewolf genre. This is the Cold Rock Brothers. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.